Good morning, everyone. What an honor it is to come together and gather around the Word to celebrate in what the Lord has done and to learn about Him again this morning. Uh, before we dive into the Word this morning, I just want to once again ask that we thank the team that came from Florida for serving us in a variety of ways. If Wait, 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 don't clap yet, don't clap yet. We can't clap for them yet. If you are from Florida, please stand so that we might recognize you and see who you are and where you're at. Thank you for your service and your ministry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, although many of you haven't seen all of the things that they've done this week, they were heavily involved in ministering in practical ways, in caring for our building and painting various things, cleaning out the basement of the nursery school, which was a dramatic change, and uh, helping us with a variety of other physical needs. But also, here in the church, uh, one of the biggest things that they did for us was to go out and evangelize the neighborhood and the community and tell others that we are here and that we want them to join us. And so they've done a great work for us this week, and we want to continue to encourage them. You guys are always welcome anytime. I would like to ask you now, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 21 and beginning at verse 17. You see, today we have reached the point of no return. This is the point in the book of Acts where we find that Paul is going to get arrested. However, this arrest is not like any of the other ones that we've already seen. Typically, his imprisonments are just like short stints. Think of like the Philippian jail where he was there for just a few hours before there was an earthquake which released him, and then he went back in the morning and spoke to those who were in charge. But really, that was only a one-night stay. This detainment, however, is going to last from here to the very end of the book of Acts. This imprisonment is the one that had been warned about by Agabus earlier in this chapter. And now we come to one of the most pivotal moment, moments in the life of Paul. So let me ask that you read along as I read aloud the holy, perfect, inspired Word of God. Acts chapter 21, verse 17. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present, after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you, are also, but that you yourself also live in observance under the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed... We have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what is sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up. And the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when he saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! 
As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the Assyrians into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia and a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. This is the holy word of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that today as we come to this passage of very inter- interesting and concerning issues, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand it. Lord, this is a passage that is greatly debated among scholars and one that is very challenging to understand. But we ask, Lord, that you would help us not only to understand it, but to apply it and to live it out, that we might be transformed by the Spirit of God and that we might live for Christ well because of what we hear from you today. Lord, I ask that we would indeed have clarity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. People make a lot of mistakes. Um, All of us know that there are times we have made mistakes. Uh, These mistakes that I'm talking about are mistakes that are made out of ignorance. For example, when I first moved to Italy, I the first person that I met that could speak English was named Tom, and I said to Tom, I'm really hungry, Tom. Is there any way that I could find some food? And he said, well, just go around the corner. There's a little place there. Uh, It's called a bar, but in Italy, everything that sells food in the middle of the day is called a bar. And he said, just go around to the bar over there and ask them for this particular kind of food. And he told me how to pronounce it. And he said, it's kind of like a donut or a little biscuit or something. It'll be great. So I went over, and I ensured that I was saying it exactly as he had said it, and I ordered exactly what he told me to, and instead of bringing out food, they brought me a large cup of liquid. And I said, I don't know what this is, but it smells really bad. So in order not to be rude, I just drank it as quickly as I could in one drink. I later found out that this is called grappa. Grappa is like vodka made out of the stems of, of grapes, And uh, being that you know me, I don't drink alcohol, that was a pretty hard-hitting moment for me, and that was a mistake born out of ignorance. Uh, I later found out that Tom not only did not know Italian, but he had the worst accent in Italian that I've ever heard, so I never asked him for advice again. Sometimes we make mistakes, and this passage that we looked at today, it's full of mistakes. In particular, today, we're going to look at three kinds of mistakes that are evident in the passage. First, we're going to see mistaken intentions, and then we're going to see mistaken actions, and finally, mistaken identity. Let's begin by seeing the beginning of the passage where we find mistaken intentions. When when Paul first arrived in Jerusalem, he was greeted very warmly by the church there. He was greeted by the leaders, in particular James, who was noted as their host, And as the leader of the Jerusalem church, James is operating kind of like the spokesman here for all of their elders. And it's probably helpful to know that when Paul arrived, he did not come empty-handed. He actually carried with him a very large sum of money that he had been collecting from all of the various churches that he had been serving. We read about this in many places, but in particular, we learn about it in Romans 15, where he there states that this money was gathered, quote, for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. He was coming to serve the people that he loved. He knew that they had been suffering under a recent persecution, and he also knew that they had been suffering under a recent famine, and there were many people in Jerusalem who had many physical and practical needs, so he came with money to serve them. This large sum is probably part of the reason that Paul found it necessary to travel with a very large entourage, far more people than usual. We read about those nine Gentile believers back in Genesis chapter 20. The other reason that these men, these nine other Gentiles, were probably brought along was to serve as living proof of all the good things that God had been doing by saving the Gentiles. God saved people in Ephesus. Do you want to see? Here's Trophimus. God saved people, and he went on and on and on to show all of these different individuals from the different cities that the Lord had saved from across the Roman Empire. The initial response that we find in verse 20 is a positive response. It says, and when they heard it, they glorified God. The elders heard this, and they knew it was good news, and they gave all of the glory and praise to God for saving the souls of these other people far away. And so far, everything is going wonderfully. But right here in the middle of verse 20, we come to a record scratch kind of moment. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? 
They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. So what's the problem here exactly? What is it that's making the people of Jerusalem nervous? What is it that they have heard about Paul that they don't like about Paul? It was that they believed Paul was telling Jews to reject Jewish customs. Well, why would they think that? Well, it's due to some of the writings of Paul, no doubt, writings that dealt with issues where law and liberty come into conflict. Consider just a couple of those with me for a moment that specifically relate to one of the concerns mentioned, which was, he said, the people here are afraid you're telling us don't circumcise our kids. Well, what did Paul say in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6? He said, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Later in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, Paul wrote, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So the point that Paul was making about these traditions is not that they were evil, it's that they could not save or sanctify anyone. Therefore, if anyone wanted to circumcise their child on the eighth day, no problem, as long as it was not viewed as a form of entry into the covenant. Also, we see that if a Jewish person made a personal determination not to eat pork products for the rest of their life, even though the new covenant permits it, there's nothing wrong with that unless they believe that by their abstinence from pork, they are somehow receiving greater levels of holiness. However, the reason that Paul often confronted these practices was not to attack the Jewish people and tell them to stop doing these things. Rather, it was to stop the spread of the Judaizers telling the Gentiles, you must do these things. Most of the time, what had happened is there was a rampant spread of false teaching that began to demand Gentiles, in order to follow Jesus, you have to not only believe in him, but also basically become Jewish through Old Testament practices. So here we see a case of mistaken intentions. The Jewish Christians in Jerusalem saw the Gentile population of the Christians was absolutely rapidly outpacing Jewish conversion to Christianity, and it it sparked panic in them that the Gentiles would somehow eliminate their historic customs and require them to stop doing the things that they enjoyed doing. So James and the elders of the Jerusalem church devised a plan that would allow Paul to prove his cultural Jewishness to those who were Christians in Jerusalem. He was supposed to join these other four men in a Nazarite vow. Earlier, you heard the reading of the word, and we learned about what a Nazarite vow included. It was a separation from certain kinds of food and abstinence from touching dead things. And it seems that over time, there were shifting requirements that were also added to this. And so there's debate in the scholarly world about all of the things that were expected of somebody who would take a Nazarite vow in this time. But what we know for sure is that at this point, the main thing that we find in our text is that at the conclusion of this time, they were required to go into the temple and pay for a haircut. And so they would undergo this ritual purification in the temple courts. Well, here's where things get a little bit tricky. There is an incredible amount of debate on whether this was the right or wrong thing to do. This is perhaps, and actually I don't even think I would say perhaps, I think this is the most debated section of the book of Acts that I have researched so far. And today how I'm going to operate is just to share with you three views that are given regarding what is taking place here. And I'm going to provide you with the first two, which I perceive to be great extremes, and which I also perceive to be inaccurate, but I'm going to give you those two because I think by showing you why I think those two perspectives are inaccurate, it will help you to see why what the accurate perspective is, is of such great value. So here's where we're going to start. The first perspective that people give is that they believe James and the Jerusalem elders were completely wrong to ask Paul to carry out this vow. Those who adopt this view believe that the elders were basically functioning in a cowardly manner, that they were seeking to placate the feelings of ignorant believers rather than actually teaching them or instructing them in the truth. And they, the people who believe this often read into it very much 
racial hatred against the Gentiles. For example, Kent Hughes, an excellent preacher and an excellent commentator, he writes, quote, The mother church was a compromising, prejudiced church, and her sins of lying gossip and spineless accommodation eventuated in Paul's rejection. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of how negatively he views what is going on in their request to Paul. But here's why I don't think that Kent Hughes gets this one quite right. Notice that the elders of the church in Jerusalem seem to welcome Paul and all of his Gentile companions. In verse 17, look at that in your Bible. I think this is important. It says in verse 17, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. There does not seem to be any racial animosity here. And this is especially highlighted when the elders give glory to God for all of the expansion of the kingdom far beyond the reaches of the empire, uh, far reaches of the empire and far outside of the Jewish community. But what about the rest of the congregation? Were they being prejudiced here? Well, it doesn't appear so to me. It appears that they were bothered that somebody would call their actions sinful. And this was, of course, a misunderstanding of Paul's actual teaching, which likely occurred because he had not been there to explain his teachings in person. Everything that they were hearing was nothing more than hearsay. So I do not believe that James or the elders or the congregation at Jerusalem were actually operating out of wicked motives. And the second option that people often raise is on the far opposite side of the spectrum, that Paul was wrong to carry out this act of entering into the temple. They believe that shaving his head and paying for this ritual cleansing was actually sinful. For example, James Montgomery Boyce pulls no punches when he says this, Paul's error was worse than hypocrisy, though it was that too. It was a compromise of the gospel. The same apostle who had written so many New Testament books, the man who had argued so forcefully that we are saved by Jesus Christ alone, was about to go into the Jewish temple in the presence of the very priest who had crucified the Lord and there participate with others in the sacrifice of an animal that was meant to be an atonement for sin. This is, he was about to turn back on his back on the only sufficient sacrifice of of Christ. End quote. Now, as much as I respect James Montgomery Boyce, there is a glaring problem with his argument. The request of the elders and the plan that was agreed to by Paul does not include sacrificial worship of any kind. In fact, all it required was paying for a haircut. Paul's actions here do not seem to have any bearing on the Old Covenant religious practices that were brought to a conclusion at the death of Christ. So those who hold this view often highlight the oddity of him going into the temple. Well, if that's true, then why was he even in the temple in the first place? That place was no longer the place of worship. Well, it's strange to me that people don't acknowledge the fact that many times already in the book of Acts, we find the Christian church gathering within the courts of the temple. For example, probably the easiest and most known way for me to describe this is through that famous moment in the beginning of Acts chapter 3 where it says, Peter and John went to pray and they met a lame man on the way. If you actually read the text, verse 1 tells us exactly where they were going. They were going to the courts of the temple to pray. So it doesn't seem odd to me that they, they would still continue to worship God in the temple. It's just that now they were able to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Which leads us now to the third option, the one that I do believe is correct. I believe that Paul was working alongside the Jerusalem elders to do everything possible to bring peace and to dispel suspicion. Now, this is not the first time that Paul carried out a kind of Jewish practice just for the sake of ministry. For example, all the way back in Acts chapter 16, verse 3, you may remember that Paul circumcised Timothy when Timothy joined their troop. Well, he had already taught many times that there is no salvation through circumcision and there is no sanctification that comes through circumcision, so why on earth would he perform this surgery? Well, of course, it was so that there would be a ministerial benefit so that Timothy would be able to go into a place like the synagogues that they went to in every city, and if somebody asked him, are you a circumcised man, he could answer and say, yes, I am, and have credibility within the Jewish community to preach and teach the Word of God. Also, in Acts chapter 18, verse 18, when Paul was in Corinth, 
we actually already see that Paul himself, apart from any outside influence, has already taken up a Nazarite vow while he was in that place. So I wholeheartedly agree with this third opinion, which comes to us from I. Howard Marshall, who explains what's going on this way. He says, The truth would seem to be that Paul was prepared to live as one who was under the law to those under the law. We're going to cut the quote there, although there's more that we could read to it. This is part of what it looks like to become all things to all men. Paul was not worshiping in a way that was contrary to the gospel. He was not carrying out old customs from the old covenant. He was seeking to find common ground with those who were still culturally his Jewish brothers. Now, perhaps you're asking yourself, like, okay, like I hear the three positions. Why in the world does any of that matter? Well, here's why. Because this question is still one of the most pertinent questions on the mission field today. How do we find common ground with those who disagree with us about the gospel and who are also culturally far different from us? Where is the line regarding how much we adopt their cultural practices? But let's be real. This is not just a question for the mission field. This is a question that we have to answer all the time right here and now. You and I need to know how to do this very thing on Long Island. Where is the line? How do we become all things to all men to our Muslim co-workers or our Hindu neighbors? Should we go to the mosque with them? Should we take part in Hindu worship? Absolutely not. Well, what if it's not a religious aspect? What, is it, what if it's just a sinful aspect? Should we go to a bar with our old buddy from high school who has become a raging alcoholic? Well, absolutely not. Is it okay for us to do that if we just think we're going to go there to share the gospel? Well, it's important for us to know that there is a line somewhere, and there is a line that should not be crossed. So I want to give you two very simple tests that we can use to derive whether or not your attempt to become all things to all men is acceptable according to the Scripture. Test number one, is it a form of false worship? If you were to go into a place like a mosque or a temple or into a Roman Catholic cathedral, I believe that would be like Paul going into the temple and performing a sacrifice. If he were to go in and kill an animal for the atonement of his sins, that would have been a rejection of the gospel, just like James Montgomery Boyce said. But thankfully, he did not do that. That was never part of the plan. But if you go into another place of worship, you are indeed taking part in false worship. You are attempting to validate, in some sense, that false worship. If there is a false form of worship, reject it and take no part in it. And test number two is the question, is the act that you are performing encouraging someone else to sin? For example, sitting at the bar with your alcoholic friend is sending a message to them that you are comfortable with them in their sin. Now, of course, you can display that you love them and care for them, but you can do so without putting a stamp of approval on their sinful actions. In other words, I believe that we are to be like Paul and be all things to all men, but we are to do so without ever compromising the gospel. Which brings us to our second point in the text today. We've seen that there was a mistake about his intentions. Now we're going to see that there's mistaken actions. The second scene that unfolds in our text is a false accusation that was levied against Paul. You see, the first part of our text was focused in on those who were Christian Jews. Now, there were some unbelieving Jews that had come down for the celebration of Pentecost. In particular, the text tells us that the ones who were in question here are ones that had traveled from Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. Most notably, the city there was Ephesus. Now, notably, they recognized a man named Trophimus who happened to be from Ephesus. And they saw this man walking around in Jerusalem during the week with Paul. Now, it's at this point... If you remember, the the Jews in Ephesus rioted against Paul. They are the ones who sought to kill him. They are going to take that riot that they had performed in Ephesus and bring it with them to Jerusalem. So when they found this man, Trophimus, with Paul wandering the streets of their holy city, they assumed that Paul must have brought him into the temple. Have you ever had somebody who was looking for any opportunity to catch you in some kind of mistake? Maybe you had a boss that was watching over your shoulder nonstop to just make sure they could crush you at first opportunity. Uh, They are already suspicious of you, so they're looking for the slightest possible evidence that they could find to destroy you and pounce on you. 
Well, in this case, the Jews from Ephesus were so eager to pin something on Paul that they made the assumption that since he had been walking around the city out there with Trophimus, he must have come in here with Trophimus, although that never happened. In order to understand why that's such a big deal, you need to know a little bit about how the temple was designed. It was basically a number of concentric rectangles inside one another. At the very center was the Holy of Holies, once entered a year by a high priest. There was literally only one man one time a year that would go into that room. Then the next layer out, there was a larger rectangle called the Court of the Jews. This was the inner court. This is where the priests and the men of high standing would go to worship. Then there was an outer court called the Court of the Women. And then surrounding that was the furthest outer court, which was called the court of the Gentiles. And that's where those who were not Jewish were permitted to go in and enter. They were permitted to go and worship. And if you remember, when Jesus goes in and he flips the tables, or in John chapter 2, when he makes that whip of cords and he goes and drives people out, the place that he is driving them out from, the place where they are selling all of these things and exchanging money, was in the court of the Gentiles. They had turned that place where the Gentiles were to come in and worship into a place of money exchange. Well, historians tell us that during this time, there was a low beam that would mark the entryway from the outer court of the Gentiles into the court of the women. And that beam had an inscription written on it that said this, No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. That's pretty ominous. In other words, There is no way that Trophimus just happened to wander into the interior courts of the temple. He was certainly not there. And at this time, even the Romans, who were very invasive as rulers over Israel, they even respected this rule and would not go into the inner courts. However, in order to get around this rule, they built a large guard tower right outside of the temple. And you know how it is. When there's a rule, people find ways to get around it. We can't go in there, but we're going to build a tower tall enough that we can look down and observe everything that's taking place in there so that the Jews can't hide from us what they're doing. We can always have an eye and an ear monitoring their activity. So when the accusations begin to fly that Paul brought someone into the inner courts, Paul was immediately at the center of a violent mob. James was not wrong about the fact that the population of Jerusalem was adamant and zealous about the law. So as soon as they heard, somebody brought a Gentile in there, then they become very angry and they begin to beat Paul. They take him to the outer court and begin to crush his body with blow after blow. And it tells us that the violence was so severe that Luke says that Paul literally had to be carried out of that place. Now, there's a debate about whether or not that means his injuries were so bad that he could not walk, or if that means that he was under so much consistent fighting that they literally had to carry him between them so that nobody could hit him on his way out the door. Interestingly, when the soldiers arrived, they do not ask the innocent victim in the middle of the mob what happened. They don't ask him the reason that he was being mistreated. Instead, they ask the ravenous mob, what did he do? Now, their venom was so extreme that they could not even pause to make a clear accusation against Paul. Does that sound familiar? Somebody trying to accuse somebody in the middle of uh, an unrighteous uh, arrest and somebody who was attacked and brutalized, and they begin to try to accuse him, and they can't even get their story straight. Hopefully that sounds familiar to you. Well, instead of getting their story straight, they just continued to talk over one another. Well, perhaps you can, in some minor way, relate to this. Perhaps you have had people mistake your actions. Maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, they've done this in order to find reason to harm you. The promise of persecution stands true for all Christians. All who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. But what I want you to see is that in this moment, Paul was identifying with Christ in a very real way that can only be experienced when you encounter persecution. Consider the way that Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. He explains it this way. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Blessed. 
because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Christ has called us to pick up our cross daily. And for you, that might include persecution. It might include getting mocked or ridiculed. It might include losing a promotion at work. It might include being ostracized by a family member. But when those trials of persecution come, please know that Christ is not calling you to do anything that he has not already done himself for you. He was like a lamb shed, led to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. You see, the good news of the gospel is this. Not that Paul was persecuted to give the good message. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is himself the good message, came here and was persecuted. He was missed by people. Even though his actions were always loving, his actions were always kind, he was mistreated anyway. They mistook his actions for self-gain. Jesus himself has come to give of himself for his people. Jesus died to save sinners like you and me. Now, there are many people in this room, and I am confident that there are those in this room who have not yet bowed the knee to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you don't know what it means that Jesus Christ died for you, I beg of you, please don't leave this place without speaking to me. I want you to know Christ in a saving way. You see, he not only came and was mistaken, he came and was rejected. His message was denied. He was turned away from, not just by those in his day, but by us today. Every single one of us have turned away from him and denied him. And that message of love and kindness and salvation that he has proclaimed to us, we have said no thank you at best and much, harshly, much harsher at worst. We have all turned aside to our own way. The important news for you to know today is that you, you can be forgiven. If you just trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved and your sins forgiven. He not only died for sinners like you, he is alive today for sinners like you and me. He lives to be our Savior. So trust in Christ and you will be saved. For those of you who are believers, remember that Jesus himself said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. One of the interesting things to me about this particular beatitude is that of all of the eight beatitudes, this one is about six times longer than all of the other ones. When it comes to persecution, he gives you far more explanation and says there is great blessing that is produced by actually experiencing persecution for the name of Christ. There are particularized eternal blessings that are given to those who experience this kind of suffering. Jesus did nothing wrong, yet people with wicked hearts gathered around in a mob crying out, crucify him. In verse 36 of our passage, Paul did nothing wrong, but he was surrounded by a mob of people saying, away with him. In this moment, Paul was sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And the question for us today is, are we willing to do the same thing? In whatever ways the Lord requires of us, are we willing to lay down our comfort, to lay down our ambition, to lay down our personal goals and our pride in order to honor the one who saved us and who sought us and who bought us with his redeeming love? He is worthy. Which brings us to our third point of the morning, mistaken identity. Mistaken identity can actually happen in a, ver a variety of ways. Most of the times we think of it in a positive sense, like you see somebody at Target and you think, is that Jimmy Fallon? And then you get a little bit closer and you realize, that's not Jimmy Fallon, that's Mike Neglia. <laughs> Whoops. But the opposite can actually also occur, where you can have mistaken identity in a negative sense, for example, Charlie Chaplin once came in third place in a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest. In the closing scene of our text today, we see a case of mistaken identity. Paul is mistaken in both of these ways. Uh, Paul is mistaken for a violent Egyptian insurrectionist first. Just like Mike really doesn't resemble Jimmy Fallon at all, the closer these people examined Paul, the more quickly they realized he doesn't match the description of this criminal Egyptian that we're looking for. Uh, this guy who led an army into the wilderness, that doesn't seem to be Paul at all. In verse 39, Paul positively IDs himself by simply saying, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, the most important word that he said in that sentence was the word citizen. Although it might seem like a casual inclusion to us, it was an explosive declaration that he had certain rights that were not afforded to non-citizens of the empire. 
Citizenship was a hard-earned or a high-cost right that was only afforded to select families. In fact, the very man he was speaking to, the Roman soldier, probably had not yet earned the right to be called a citizen. Next week, we are going to hear Paul's speech to his own countrymen, but for today, I simply want to close by considering the way that Paul interacts with people who mistook his identity. Put yourself in Paul's shoes. He's just been beaten to a bloody pulp by his own people. Then, even though he was the victim, he was arrested by the Romans. He was carried to the steps by the Romans to the watchtower, and then listen to how politely he speaks to the Roman tribune after all of this suffering. He asked, may I say something to you? Now, I don't know about you, but I think if I was in this scenario, my response would be far more aggressive. I think that my heart would be angry. I think that I would be crying out for my rights. The fact that he was speaking in Greek threw off this Roman soldier and made it clear to him, Paul must not be the Egyptian rebel. But at this point, he was now confused, who is this guy? So from this point forward, what we're going to see in the book of Acts is Paul interacting with unbelievers, mostly Romans, and we're going to see the way that he deals with various rulers and soldiers and kings. And in the process, Paul is constantly seeking to clarify his message to them. Every single one of them misunderstand what he is saying. Every single one of them mistook his identity. They mistook his purposes. They mistook his message. But how does Paul respond? Even though they think that he has negative motives or nefarious intentions, Paul simply responds humbly and patiently and continuously to correct them and explain the true purpose of his mission. Once again, Paul was imitating the one who saved him. There has never been a person in the history of the world whose identity has been more mistaken than Jesus Christ. Even the disciples who, when they were asked who he was, who do people say that I am? Do you remember their response? Well, some think that you're a good teacher. Some think that you're a prophet. Maybe some of them think that you're Elijah. This confusion about who Christ is, this mistaken identity, that's nothing new. It's been around since Jesus in his earthly ministry. And we knew that it was coming because he had no former majesty that we would look to him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But there were some who had their eyes opened. There were some, like the centurion that crucified him, who realized truly this man was the Son of God. How in the world did he know that? Paul was simply imitating the Savior by living faithfully, by living obediently, by living righteously in the face of extreme persecution. And in doing so, we're going to see Paul have immense opportunity to preach the gospel to those outside the kingdom. Now, it's likely that you have also been misidentified in this way, at least to a minor extent. You see, when you tell somebody that you're a Christian, when you say to somebody that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that term brings with it so much baggage for them. They are going to lump you together with every hypocrite that they have ever encountered and with every church that has ever hurt them and with every lie that they have ever been told about religious things and, about, and lump you together with every weird perversion of doctrine that they have ever heard trumpeted from TV stations. They hear you say, I'm a Christian, and then they immediately begin to misunderstand who you are and what you are saying. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, they are going to immediately identify you with many others. Not only those who disagree with you on minor aspects of doctrine, but with those who are not Christians at all. How do you dispel this kind of misconception? How do you get them to hear what you're actually saying? Well, how did Paul do that in our text? With winsomeness and consistency. The only people that Jesus ever spoke harshly to were the ones who knew who he was and yet rejected him, namely the religious rulers. There was no case of mistaken identity there. They knew who Christ was. The people that didn't know him, like the woman at the well, those people were treated with immense respect, with immense kindness, and with much patience as he taught them about himself. Most people will still reject the message of the gospel even if you explain it explicitly and even if they hear you out and they learn exactly what you believe, most people are still going to reject it. But let's be sure that the message people are rejecting is the real message not some strange amalgamation of all the worst experiences with anyone who has ever claimed to be a Christian. Through winsome speech and consistent godliness and persistent conversation, the light of Christ will become more and more visible in your life. Our goal here is that the 
Lord may bless our efforts to be more effective in evangelizing and drawing people to himself through our conviction to care for others in this way. With that, let me close us out in a word of prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we do delight in you and we thank you that even though this is a challenging text with a lot of uh, scholarly debate surrounding it, we thank you, Lord, that the the truth of these things is certainly valid for us today, that we must indeed stand firm on our convictions, that we must indeed draw lines about where we can and cannot uh, become like our society or our culture, that we must indeed identify with Jesus Christ in our suffering, and that we must indeed proclaim the gospel, even though people often and will almost always confuse it, we must pre- present it with as much clarity and care as we possibly can. So, Lord, I pray that for everyone who knows you in this room, that we would do that and be convicted to do this well. And for everyone that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that you would please, during this service even, that you would save them, draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.